Hello, Deeper family, and greetings to all of you who may be even watching from all around the world. My name is Stephen Ivey, and I am the broadcast producer here for Deeper Fellowship Church. And we just want to take a moment to say thank you for tuning in to today's River Experience. Uh, for those of you who watched today's 11 a.m. experience, you know that we had an incredible time in the presence of the Lord, so much so that our pastor, Pastor William McDowell, didn't even get an opportunity to minister the Word of God. And if you've been following Deeper Fellowship Church for any amount of time, you know that we've been having some incredible experiences in the presence of the Lord. And although we're thankful to be a house that honors God's presence, our pastor reminded us today that we are also a house who stands on the foundation of God's Word. And so thanks to the power of technology, we are able to bring you the 8 a.m. service and it's in its entirety. We want you to be able to see everything that God had to say to us today because today was a message that you do not want to miss. It was a challenging word, but we believe that God is giving us exactly what he wants to say to us in this season. And we don't want you to miss it. So grab your family, come around whatever device that it is that you're watching on, whether it's your TV, your computer, even your mobile device. And let's lean in to what God has to say to us today. We stand for the reading of the word to honor the Lord and his word, to say that his word is unlike anything else. And so we are excited to share uh, the word of the Lord. Um, let's look at Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, uh, starting with verse 32. And um, as soon as I start reading, you're going to be like, oh, okay, I see what kind of message this is. And you are correct. <laughs> I thought I was joking with Pastor Caleb yesterday. I said, you know, I prepared what the Lord had given me, and, and I knew that it was, was confronting. And then I was like, okay, um, you know, maybe he'll wake, wake me up in the morning and say, no, I really want you to, to wrap your arms around the people and love them and, 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 and all that stuff. But I love you. <laughs> this is my hug. <laughs> but the word is confronting. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, we'll read the scripture and then we will pray together. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my father in heaven. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you help us to receive the word that you have for us today. Father, I pray that our hearts, all of our hearts, and I say our, not theirs. I pray that all of our hearts would be open to hear and receive the seed of your word and that it would affect and change the way we live. Lord, I pray for the grace, the anointing, the ability, the authority to declare your word. Speak through me, Holy Spirit. Have your way in this place. As always, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And because of your grace and mercy, would you also save people in this room? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Look at somebody next to you and say, get ready. <laughs> uh, by the direction of the Holy Spirit, we have been talking about prayer, uh, the necessity of prayer and the power of prayer. And, and prior to that and connected to that, we were also talking about the blade of revival and those two things are connected. Um, I believe uh, that the things that the Lord had Pastor Caleb preach to us the last two weeks were absolutely from the Lord. 
Um, it is what the Lord is saying to us. Our, our prayer calls this week have also uh, resonated and amplified and layered that theme uh, over and over because the Holy Spirit is saying this to us. It is uh, an invitation, uh, but it's also an admonition. It is, it is an invitation by God because of his love. He will say things to us that we need and in order to spark us and, and, and cause us and to remind us of the place of partnership that he's invited us into. At the same time, uh, the fact that he has to say it to us is also a confrontation. Thank God for the two amens I got right there. If I can't get amens right here, y'all are going to be quiet the whole time. <laughs> um, we will, by the grace of God, come back to prayer uh, and, and connect this to prayer, um, but we're going to take a different path altogether. I, I understood as the Lord began to, to download this to me and speak this to me and, and confront me uh, as well. Um, I recognize that my goal um, a lot of times is the past is to try to finish whole thoughts, but I recognize that if I tried to connect this back to prayer, um, the point that the, the Holy Spirit and the emphasis that the Holy Spirit wanted us to receive today might get lost as I try to connect things back so I just have to take my time but in taking my time we got to deal with some scriptures that are going to make us say ouch <laughs> as many of you know I just came back from Israel um, affectionately known as the Holy Land um, and to be honest with you I had the most amazing time there. I, I said to you last week that, that all those people who say that you need to go to Israel because it will change your life, you need to go to the Holy Land because it will change your life, it will change your perspective, it will change your walk with God, um, they were not kidding. Um, now, I'm, I'm not one given to hyperbole, so I was just thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm expecting it's going to be amazing, but I did not expect um, what I felt while I was there. And, and to be honest with you, um, I, I haven't been able to stop thinking about my time there. While I am physically back home, I'm still learning daily from what I experienced there. Every single day, there is a new unfolding or a new thing that is birthed in my heart as it relates to it. And so literally, I find myself, even though I've been back for more than a week now, reliving things over and over, but not just reliving memories, but learning and being taught uh, by being immersed in the experience there. And, and specifically, my time in Jerusalem has affected me um, in a very unique and specific way, which actually informs the posture uh, of, of, our, of our time today. Um, while I was there, I was able to see a lot of things. I, I saw the Sea of Galilee, the, where Jesus walked on the water, and we were uh, on a boat ride having a time of worship there. And I got to, to see and stand on Mount Carmel where Elisha called down fire from heaven. And I got to go to En Gedi and to David's waterfall where David wrote some of the Psalms. And I stood in the Valley of Elah where David killed Goliath. I, I picked up some smooth stones from the brook, uh, the same brook that he picked up stones from to, to kill Goliath. And I went to Bethlehem where Jesus was born and in Shepherd's Field where the angels announced to the shepherds the birth of Christ and many other places that I can't wait for all of us to experience. Like I've already talked to a company about taking all of us. But I was really struck. Now, y'all got to pay for it, but I just want to let you know. <laughs> They're like, and he's going to pay for it? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> I understand if I say, start seeing a bunch of GoFundMes. I get it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was struck by Jerusalem, though. Um, walking the streets of Jerusalem, the holy city, I was struck by a number of things, but one of the things I was struck by was the amalgam of cultures, particularly the major religions that all consider that place to be holy to them. Through the ages and centuries, wars have been waged over the control of that city. Jews consider it holy. Muslims consider it holy. Christians consider it holy. All of these religions claiming the same territory because of some historical significance and, and, and some historical right to the land. And so here you are standing in this city where all of these cultures and all of these religions say, this is mine. 
And then I thought about Christ and specifically his words. And I was struck by the authority and the exclusivity of his words. And also by the faith of the believers, the initial believers. Jesus um, stands in the midst of all of this and basically because of the way our minds think, because of the way that the world wants us to think, we're like, well, can't we just all get along and maybe it's holy to everybody and there's all these different ways, but it's the same God. Jesus is like, uh-uh. I know y'all, y'all don't want to say amen. The problem is if we can't say amen in the Christian church, we got a problem. So Jesus, he, he's like, um, uh, here, here's the deal. I will stand here in the midst of all of these other ideologies and all these other beliefs, and I will say to you, um, I am the only way. There is a level of exclusivity that most people, if we were to be very honest, we don't actually like about Christianity. It it becomes the off-ramp for for, for many people because they don't like the exclusivity. We, We almost don't like exclusive anything. We want everybody to be included in everything. My thing is this, and I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but if you want everybody to be included in Christianity, tell people about it. I know that we, we, we struggle with this, but Jesus made bold, authoritative, and definitive statements about who he was. Um, John chronicles um, these statements uh, very well uh, in his gospel. Um, in John chapter 6, he chronicles Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. Also in John chapter 6, he chronicles Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, I am the door or the gate. Also in John chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John chapter 15, I am the vine. John chapter 14, let's look at it really quickly. Verse 1, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a, would I have told you, excuse me, that I'm going to prepare prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. Now, Thomas is like, no, we don't know, Lord. Thomas said, we have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way. The truth and the life. Listen to these words. No one can come to the Father except through me. Family, no one can come to the Father except through me. This is what Jesus said. There is not another way. This is a statement of exclusivity. I know it's tight, but it's right, but it shouldn't be tight. In John chapter 10, after speaking a a parable about the sheep gate, John chapter 10 verse 6 picks up this way. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I know y'all King James are like, I come that you might have life and that more abundantly I helped you. (laughs) This is another statement of authority and exclusivity. I'm I'm reading these things because we've done this thing in church where, where we spend an hour explaining what Jesus said. I just want to point out the fact that Jesus just said it. And it is what it is. It it was a situation where it's like, this is what it is. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Any questions? 
We're like, okay, but see, when he said that he's the way, then it means this. And then when it said he's the truth, it means this. And when he said it's a life, it means this. And I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, this is just kind of, you know what he said? No, no, no. He just said, listen, if you were trying to get to the Father, um, you can't use Muhammad. If you, are, if you are trying to get to the Father, you can't go there through Buddha. You, you, you might become enlightened, but you won't get to the Father. I, I'm trying to help you. If you want something from God, there is a way, and I am he. And I stand in Jerusalem where everybody else says there's all these other ways. I just want you to understand they are taking a way to a different God, but not the Most High God. He, he, he makes these statements. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. You know, I was reading a commentary resource that opened uh, the dialogue concerning some of these passages of scripture with some of the most initially jarring words that one could say. Now, I'm about to tell you what they are, and they might hit you, but I was thinking about this. The fact that it hits us this way, and we say that we are Christians, means something about where we are. Are you ready? These were the words. Are you ready? I'm waiting on y'all. Are you ready? Okay. This is what it said. Jesus Christ is the most divisive person in the world. Oh, y'all, y'all got quiet. Y'all said, I said, I said, are y'all ready? Yes! Then I said it, y'all was like, mm. You're like, oh, pastor, I'm scared for you that you're going to end up on Instagram. It went on to say, when we know about him, we are either for him or against him. It should be understood that when God confronts us in the person of Christ, it is not by a law or a philosophy from which we can accept select parts and reject others. When we are confronted with a person, we must accept or reject him. God did not send a set of morals that we get to choose from. This is the Jesus that we have created. Y- y- y'all? Oh. <laughs> he didn't just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to send another tablet. I'm going to send another few tablets, and you guys decide which ones are good and which ones are bad based on how society is at that time. No, no, no. He came in the form of a person. And you have to either accept the person or reject the person. Let me make it personal to you. Um, I don't know if you have a healthy marriage. If you have a healthy marriage, I don't know any one of you who would accept a friend that does not accept your spouse. It's not, I like you, I'll hang out with you, but I can't stand your wife. Anybody in a healthy marriage would be like, well, then goodbye. You can't, let them. we are a package deal. We, we, are, we are one. We are the modeling the mystery of marriage. You can't, you can't say you like me, but you don't like my spouse. You can't say that you like parts of Jesus. You, you, when, when God sent Jesus and he came as a person, it was to accept or reject the person. <laughs> you can accept parts of an ideology or a philosophy, but you cannot accept parts of a person. Christ confronts us. He confronts us. He confronts who and what we worship. He confronts what we love. He confronts what we desire and what we crave. He confronts what we treasure. He confronts what we believe. The truth of the matter is people shove God out of their lives because they have other gods. Yeah, I'm sorry. It it doesn't get any better. The laughter we had at the beginning, that was the laughter. 
Uh, uh, the, the truth of the matter is we have things that we serve and give our devotion to and we shove God out of our lives because he interferes with what we want and because we think that the way of Christ is too demanding. But there's a truth. He divides between religion and relationship. He divides between secular and sacred. He divides between the temporal and the eternal. We are called to live for two worlds for the eternal overlaps the world of time. And if we should gain this world alone, that's all we will ever have is this world. I understand that everybody wants to be rich and everybody wants to be famous and everybody wants to be powerful in this world. I don't know about you, but I think we ought to recover the thought that I'm living to live again. This life is short, but there is an eternity in which I will reign and rule with him. And I am looking forward to the other side. I know that I know we love our lives so much. We don't even know how much in love with the world we are. But I am in I'm looking forward to a world that I see in a distance and I welcome it. And I say there is a place. There is a place where there is no more sin. There is a place where there is no more struggle. There is a place where there is no more flesh. There is a place where there is no more dying. There is a place where there is no more crying. There is a place where there is no more war. There is a place, and I'm looking for that place. This world is not my home. Take this world and give me him. This Jesus requires from us a radical devotion. He requires from us a radical devotion. Let's let's look at another passage of scripture, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Remember, Jesus just said stuff. It is what it is. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around. And said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. (laughs) We're like, what? Everything we do is trying to get a large crowd. We on social media, we buy followers. Trying to get a large crowd, doing whatever you can to get a large crowd. Jesus saw that he had a large crowd and said, let me do something. Because all of y'all ain't here for the right reason. And and, and so I just kind of want to weed this out because I don't want all of y'all thinking that you're following me into heaven. So because some of y'all are here because you like what I do, some of y'all are here because you like what, how I make you feel. Some of y'all are here because you want a blessing. Some of y'all are here because you want to see a miracle. Some of y'all are here because you're trying to see what's up. Some of y'all are here because somebody else brought you. Let me just make it all clear to y'all. So he's walking, and he turns around, and he says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. You know these are the scriptures that we skip because this is the Jesus that we don't like. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you can't be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Let me just stop here because um, um, everybody knew that, that, that Rome was, was actually famous for crucifixion. They, they perfected crucifixion. They didn't make it up, but they decided, let's, let's, perfect, let's perfect it. Let's make it worse. Let's make it feel worse. And let's do something to make sure that everybody knows don't mess with us. So what they would do is they would hang people on crosses on the roads that everybody would pass. So that when you were trying to come into a major city, you had to pass and say, there are all the people who violated Rome. And Jesus knew that the cross meant death. It's not a metaphor. I know we teach it as a metaphor. We teach it as, okay, you got to lose your life. You got to lay down your life, you know, whatever. In other words, there'll be times when you have to do things you don't want to do. We use it as a metaphor. This was not a metaphor for Jesus. Jesus was like, okay, look, if you want to be my disciple, you see these people hanging on this cross, you're going to have to do that too. 
Okay, see, this is where y'all are like, okay, wait, this is, isn't like the goal of preaching um, to, to encourage us? That's the American gospel. That is not the Bible. Okay, y'all, y'all, uh-uh, all right, all right. Like, I, I don't know about that church. Like, I left kind of feeling a little something. Conviction. Conviction. <laughs> And then normally I would stop and say, you know, and this, if you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else. And I've even placed the emphasis on by comparison, which is true. By comparison is to say that the way that you are to love God is that the, if people were to compare your love for God to your love for anything else, they wouldn't call what you have anything else love. Right? So, so that's where we place our emphasis. And why do we place our emphasis there? Number one, because it's true. But number two, because we want to soften it. <laughs> um, but, he says, don't begin. This is now, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. And if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Look at verse 28 again. But don't begin. Somebody say, don't begin. This is very important. I want to say this again. Everybody help me preach here. Say, but don't begin. begin. Y'all not saying it loud enough because y'all afraid of what I'm about to say next. Say it with me. But don't begin begin. until you count the cost. For the rest of verse 28 says, for who will begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Don't begin until you count the cost. Don't begin until you count the cost. How do you count the cost if you don't know what's coming or what the future holds? You pay up front. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. How can you count the cost of following Jesus if you don't know where following Jesus is going to lead? You pay up front. What do you pay up front? Everything. You decide that you're committed at the beginning to do whatever it takes. You know, we have a beautiful chorus we just sang. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. We sing it, the tears roll down the face. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back which is to say that when you decide at the beginning to follow Jesus, you are saying that nothing is off limits. You are saying that following him is worth everything. So the reason why you count the cost is that you look at your life, you look at what you own, you look at what you have, and you say, okay, if he requires all of this, I'm good. If you come to him and you say you can have this but not this, you're not ready. If you come to him and you say you can have Sundays but Monday through Saturday is mine, you're not ready. If you come to him and you say this is my money instead of this is your money that I'm a steward of, You're not ready. This is one of the reasons why we know that people who use Christ as a means to get rich are not actually followers of Christ. Y'all didn't like that at all. Why? Because you think that you have something that's yours. Those who count the cost at the beginning are those who say, I have looked at everything. And I have decided that you are worth more than all I have. You are worth more than every relationship I have. You are worth more than my status. You are worth more than my reputation. You are worth more than my house. You are worth more than my car. You are worth more than my money. And oh, by the way, um, you are worth, I know this is going to be hard for you. You are worth more than my family. 
I know you're like, I don't love anybody more than my family. You need to understand that when Jesus made the statement that you must love me more than father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, what he was saying is when you come to me, even if they don't come, even if your mother or your brother or your sister or your father or your son and your daughter say, I can't do this Jesus thing. You say, you know what? I, I, I'm sorry, but I've got to go to him because he means more to me than even you. And I won't stand before the throne and say the reason why I didn't come to Jesus is because they wouldn't come. You are going to stand before the Lord on your own. You won't stand on a group because why? Wide is the way to destruction, but narrow is the way to life. You can't come to God in a group. You got to come on your own. <laughs> Don't begin until you count the cost. Don't begin until you count the cost. You're not paying as you go. You're not paying as you go. Okay, this is, this is the problem. Too many people in the body of Christ are paying as they go, which is why they start out one way, but then when he requires something of them, they say that costs too much, and then they get stuck. No, no, no. If we are actually going to follow Jesus, it's all at the beginning. You pay everything up front. You decide you have my whole heart. You have my whole life. You have my whole mind. You have everything I have. You are worth following, and I'm not going to hold on to anything if it means losing you because if I hold on to this I will only have this but if I let go of it and I grab you we can't pay as we go family we don't get to decide you have my yes today but you don't have it tomorrow when I gave you my yes I gave it to you completely when I gave you my heart I gave it to you completely I gave you all of me For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. There's the person who said they were called to preach. But they decided to stay at the bank. <laughs> there's the person who stood before us and said God has a calling on my life but they chased money there is the person who said that I'm supposed to be a missionary but instead they're in a pyramid scheme trying to get rich off of other people <laughs> they, they, everyone would laugh at you they say there's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot, are you, you, you see these words, you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Here's, here's the issue. We have embraced a religion without cost and call it Christianity. We have embraced a religion without cost, and then we call it Christianity, but that's not what it means to follow Christ. It's as if we no longer want to talk about the price because no one wants to be different. I, you know, the Holy Spirit chastised me because, because um, uh, at times I preach difference, and at times I don't because I recognize, um, and this is not necessarily, um, when I say preach difference, I'm not even talking about platform stuff. I'm not talking about platform stuff. I'm actually talking about private conversations in which we hide our passion to not make other people feel bad. We hide how much we talk to God, how much we need him. So we listen to other people tell us, well, you know, I mean, you know, me and God, we have an understanding. We like, mm -hmm, I understand. And we don't confront it. We don't say, no, 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 that's not, that's not, if you call yourself a Christian, this is not how we're supposed to live. I'm sorry, he doesn't understand, and neither do I. Because we got, you know, we got a one-verse Bible now, don't judge me. 
I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I feel judgment when, when you talk to me. I, I, when, 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 I, when I talk to you about my prayer life, you feel judged. You don't feel judged. You feel convicted. <laughs> we don't want to talk about it because we don't want to be different. Jesus talking to his disciples talking to his disciples. Listen to these words. Listen to this. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So, be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. But beware. For you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other unbelievers about me. Jesus didn't mince words. This is what's going to happen to you. This is where we get quiet. Because it's cold in here. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand why, because we have to make sure that when all the people come next service, it's not hot. <laughs> but when you walk the streets of Jerusalem and you realize how the first church met, there was no AC. There were no padded seats. There were no microphones. There were no lights. There was a faith in Jesus who told them that this is what's going to happen to you as a result of following me. First, count the cost. Give up everything. Decide at the beginning that everything you own belongs to God. And then this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be beaten. You're going to stand trial, and you should be grateful for the opportunity to stand trial because you wouldn't have the opportunity to talk to a governor or a king unless you were standing trial because they wouldn't pay attention to you. So the fact is, because of me, you're going to be beaten, you're going to stand trial, and that is how you are going to transform the heart of an entire nation. <laughs> we, we don't like this. This will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and other believers about me. When you are arrested, not if, when you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time for it is not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. What is he saying? Um, you guys who are believers, your brother is going to be the one to say, um, they're the ones, come get them. The father will say, um, it is my child who's following this Jesus. Come get them. See, here, here's the problem when we preach this. You think I'm preaching a first century reality. Can I tell you that in many parts of the world, this still exists right now? Oh, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. And all nations will hate you because you are my followers. I know we have this addiction to being liked. We feel like because I'm a follower of Jesus, everybody should like me. If we would just love on them and sing Kumbaya, um, they would come and they would like us. And if we could just, we don't have to tell them uh, about Jesus. Just, just show them love. And if we show them love, they'll like us and they'll love us. Jesus said, all nations will hate you because of you, because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Verse 28, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, 
The last place we went before we ended our time in Israel, we went to Caesarea, and it was one of the places where Herod uh, would spend his time. In fact, when Pastor Caleb was preaching last week, and he talked about how um, Herod got angry um, because Peter was released, and so he went to Caesarea. Caesarea is like on the sea. It's absolutely beautiful. It was like his beach home. So he went to his beach home. I'm literally, as Pastor Kate was preaching, I'm like, I was just there. And he went to his beach home, and I see why he would go there, because it was absolutely beautiful. Like, I would spend all my time there and then occasionally go to Jerusalem. <laughs> I'm like, I live in my beach home. When you need me, come get me. <laughs> that's how Caesarea was. And that's where the angel of the Lord struck him, and he died. At his beach house. But later on, they had converted his area uh, into a, a, a court. And in just last year, they just recently discovered a prison there. This prison there is where they held Paul. And they found in this prison, written in the mud, they found this inscription written by a female prisoner. Lord Jesus, help Procopius. In 60 AD, literally shortly after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the movement had so spread that this female was in prison, riding in the mud. It's still there. Lord Jesus, help Procopius. And somehow, we believe that the cost is less now. We think that when we read these things, it is a first century narrative or a second century narrative that does not apply to us today. And we think somehow the cost is less. And then convenience and comfort become the thing that we seek. And our end goal seems to be to get to heaven as comfortably as possible then we have to be motivated by the Spirit through passionate preaching to do foundational things like pray. And we don't realize how much in the flesh we are. And we don't realize how much we love the world. We are encouraged by the Spirit. We are strengthened by the Spirit. We are comforted by the Spirit. But we are also challenged by the Spirit, provoked by the Spirit, corrected by the Spirit, and convicted by the Spirit. And at times, to our detriment, we, not the Spirit, soften the edges so that it won't be confrontational and offensive and uncomfortable and unsettling. But how do you know that we need a revival? How do you know that we need a revival when comfort is the priority of the believer? You know, Rod Parsley makes this statement. It's confrontational. Um, it helps us. We've given a lot of definitions about revival. This is one of his statements. He says revival is when the church gets saved. Y'all like, I don't like that. But the truth of the matter is, we must be confronted about how we are living. How do we know? Listen, we love us. When we're preaching, we're preaching out of love. We are preaching out of obedience to the Lord, but ultimately love for his people. But I was convicted about the fact that we had to come back to preaching about prayer. That doesn't mean that we are above hearing about prayer, but hear me. If we have to preach about it, it shows us that we need revival. I know. Ain't a lot of amens right there. But the truth of the matter is, as Pastor Caleb was passionately preaching, hopefully the Holy Spirit was saying to you, hey, I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to them. 
In fact, I love it because Pastor Caleb said, hey, I'm telling you, it's me too. I wish I could tell you that I was passionately praying about this all the time, but I'm not. What is happening? We are having to acknowledge the fact that we need to stay in the perpetual posture of repentance. What is the perpetual posture of repentance? The word that you don't want us to talk about anymore? It is a perpetual turning away from the clutches and the grasp of the world, which tells us you don't need that. In other words, it is the the phraseology that says it doesn't take all that. You're okay. You're among a passionate people. You're among a praying people. You're among a preaching church. Your church preaches the truth. Your church worships. Your church prays. But do you? You don't get this by association. There is an individual responsibility to every corporate word. Just because everybody else around you has a prayer life does not absolve you from having a prayer life. Just because other people see a blade doesn't mean you see it yet. How do we know we need a revival when comfort is the priority of the believer? We need a massive revival because our churches are filled with passive believers. Can I say it again? We need a massive revival because our churches are filled with passive believers. When the core foundations of the faith need a jolt, we need a revival. When preaching on prayer becomes necessary, we need a revival. I said this to Pastor Caleb last night. I want to say it to you here. We are having to use spiritual preaching defibrillators too often. We're literally having to pull out the defibrillator and preach and put them on the body of Christ and say clear so that we can get some life. That means that we need a revival. If God is having to awaken prophets and preachers to begin to talk and pray and preach about revival, it is the defibrillators of heaven that are putting it on the body because the heart has grown cold and the heart has stopped beating for the things of God. And so therefore, God says, preach on this. Talk on this. Prophesy about this. We have, we have, we have created an ideology from certain sayings of Christ and I know I got to stop in a couple minutes and I am but we have created an ideology from certain sayings of Christ and lifted from the context of his life and purpose and we've created a palatable Jesus of morals and peace and branded it as Christianity the problem with that Jesus that we've created is the Jesus of the scripture We've created a Jesus that doesn't judge anybody. We've created a Jesus that sits silently by and says nothing about sin. We've created a Jesus that has his arms wide open accepting everybody. But I want you to know this Jesus that you've created, that you call love, that is not love at all. Because love will not sit silently and say nothing on the earth but condemn you to hell and eternity. That's not love. It's the other way around. I will confront how you live right now so that you can be with him for an eternity instead of being silent right now and you be separated for an eternity. We've got to wake up church because we're not speaking about the things that we need to be speaking about because we are addicted to the crowds. Wide is the way to destruction but narrow is the path to life and few find it. I know I'm almost finished. Y'all can come play. It'll sound soft and smooth. But the real Jesus, the real Jesus said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. Now, I'm going to deal with this in just a moment, and I'm I'm going to land the plane. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. 
You got it. I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against a mother, a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father more or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. This is the real Jesus. Luke captures the same thoughts and words. In Luke 12, I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish it were already burning. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I'm under a heavy burden until it is accomplished. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I have come to divide people against each other. We don't like this Jesus, so we skip these verses. From now on, families will be split apart. Three in favor of me and two against. Two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. We're like, please, pastor, say something else. Jesus said this. It is what it is. He's saying, hey, some people are going to make some choices about me and others in their same household are going to say, I can't do it. And some of you are in that situation right now and your heart is burdened. Keep praying, keep talking about Jesus, but certainly don't dumb down your walk with Jesus. I'm sorry if my walk offends you. I need to keep going. I'm sorry if my walk, you think, judges you. I need to keep going because I got my eyes on something. He's worth more to me than anything else. And the reality of my walk and the reality of my passion and the reality of my prayer and the reality of the way I live is confronting the way you live. Because if I continue to live this way, it is forcing you to recognize you are making a decision to reject him. Therefore you cannot dumb down your life because there are some people that you're trying to make comfortable by hiding the light but I need you to know you need to stop trying to make them comfortable because if you would live for Jesus you would find that perhaps one day they will recognize they are going the wrong direction they are living the wrong way this is why it is important for the believer to be different. This is why it's important for the believer to live different. This is why it's important to have a standard. It should be. It's okay. That's the holy roller. That's the holy man of God. I don't care if you call me that. You know why? Because what you are acknowledging is where you are too. You're like, wait, 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 wait. I'm struggling with this pastor because I, I thought, I thought, I thought he was the Prince of Peace. And, and you're reading this scripture that says, I don't think I came to bring peace. And you're like, wait a minute, is this, is this a contradictory statement? It's because you misunderstood peace. <laughs> Isaiah prophesied for her. A child is born to us, a son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And his government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen or the zeal of the Lord will make this happen. And you're like, see, he's the Prince of Peace. And I know that the angels, when, when he was born, they sang glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to men. But I want you to know that what they were announcing was his mission but we can't misunderstand his mission of peace peace on earth means restored relationship with God not the absence of conflict Jesus came as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace between God and man. He came to restore the peace between God and man. He removed the hostility between God and man. But as it relates to man and man, he came to bring division. Between God and man, he came to bring peace. But between man and man, he came to bring division. He came to make you make a decision. Preaching, I got to stop. <laughs> Preaching with the goal of only encouragement and comfort has lulled us into a passive disposition instead of a passionate disposition. <laughs> the pursuit of comfort has led to passive Christianity. 
What is one of the signs of passive Christianity? A prayerless life. And the world that we live in is constantly pulling us into passivity. Don't pray. Watch Netflix. Don't pray. Go shopping. Don't pray. Go on out to dinner. Don't, don't talk about Jesus. Talk about the game. You're like, Pastor, are you saying we can't enjoy anything? Then you have to have everything in right perspective. The problem is we got all this stuff here and Jesus down here somewhere. It needs to be flipped, y'all. Hmm. Why did we preach repentance? I'm finishing. Why must it continue to be preached? Because it's a call to perpetually turn away from the world until it loses its allure. We repent until the world is not beautiful to us. It's profane. Did you hear what I just said? We repent until the world is no longer beautiful. Only he becomes beautiful and the world becomes profane. How do you know you have things in right relationship when he becomes beautiful and the world becomes profane? They're not both beautiful to you. No, no, no. We don't like Jesus and like the world. Are y'all here? We don't, we don't like Jesus and like the world. We don't, we don't use Jesus to get status in the world. He's beautiful and the world is profane and we don't want it. That's how you know you're in a good place. How do you know you're in a good place? Not just when you can refuse it. How do you know you're in a righteous and holy position? Not just when you can abstain from it. When it is profane to you. When it is unholy, when it is unclean, when it is profane, that's how you know you are in a righteous position. <laughs> I wish I could. How do we know we are comfortable when we don't pray? When we need to be motivated to talk to the God of the universe who is also the lover of our souls. When we need to be motivated to talk to the one who died in your place, who was beaten in your place, can you imagine looking at Jesus bloodied and beaten for you and you're standing there and he's standing there and instead of saying thank you, you say, I'll get back to you. I got some other things I need to handle first. You understand. And the beaten, bloody Jesus stands there and waits for you. And we won't even communicate with him. We won't even talk to him. And he's like, I, I want to come I, I want to come into your services. I want to come into your life. I want to make you alive. I want to show you what real life is. And we're like, wait, okay, I will, Jesus. Just, just, just hold on. I just got two more episodes. I know it's really real because that's how trivial the things that we've allowed to take his place are. Jesus, I, I, I see that you, you shed your blood for me, but I, I got, first I got to secure the bag. You know, I, I, I can't, I can't. Jesus, you know I can't come to fan the flame because, you know, I mean, I got an extra shift at work. I can pocket a little bit more money. You know, I'm trying to, it's, you know, it's for your kingdom, you know, so I can finance your kingdom. You know, I, I, I got to get rich so I, I can, then I'll talk to you. Huh. And we think he understands. How do we know we're comfortable when we don't tell others about him? How do we know we're comfortable when we try to fit in instead of stand out? When the condition of the world and our families and the global church doesn't move us, we're comfortable when the opinions of others matter more to us than the opinion of Christ, we are comfortable. I'll end with this.
in this service. I can preach all this. Do you know why I can preach all this? Because he's worth it. He's worth it. If you're in this room and you don't know him, I need you to know this. He's worth it. Like, we're not talking about giving up all this stuff. And then we're like, okay, so this is the problem. We haven't preached him as beautiful. We haven't preached him as enough. We haven't preached him as fully satisfying. We, we haven't preached him as all sufficient. We, we haven't preached him as once you have him, you need nothing else. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. We, we, haven't, we haven't preached him that way. And so because of that, everybody's always thinking about what they got to give up. Um, we hear that all the time. We're like, you know, I'll come to Jesus. I, I got to just finish, you know, my, I, you know, I just got to finish my stuff first, you know, live a little while for a second, you know, have some fun. And then I'll come to Jesus because... We, we think somehow or another that the allure of the world is better than Jesus, but there is nothing better than him. There is nothing better than him on this earth and in eternity. We're not just talking about eternity alone. He's the best thing on earth. He's the best thing on earth. When you have him, you have peace. When you have him, you have the fullness of joy. When you have him, you are in your right mind. When you have him, you don't have to worry about anything. When you have him, when you have him, there is a river that flows out of you. That when you have him, his spirit leads you. When you have him, you have communion with the God of the universe. When you have him, you have an advocate. When you get in trouble, when you have him, you have a savior. When you have him, you have a deliverer. When you have him, you have a healer. When you have him, you have a provider. When you have him, you have a best friend. When you have him, you have a father. When you have him, you have a mother. When you have him, you have one who sits closer to a brother. When you have him, you are never alone. When you have him, you don't have to depend on substances when you have him when you have him when you have him he's worth it I just need a few people in this room who know that he's worth it to lift up your voice and your hands right now and to begin to acknowledge this great God, this great God who loves you, who is inviting you to himself. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You have done what no one else has done. You are what no one else is. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. And you are worth it. So we gladly, joyfully give of ourselves to you completely and totally because you are worth it. You are worth it. The beautiful one, the righteous one, the faithful one, the perfect one. Oh, the one who is compassionate and kind and loving. Oh, we give you all of ourselves. You are worth it. You are worth it. Romans 12 calls it our reasonable act of worship or service in light of what he's done. And it's the only thing that makes sense. It's the only thing that's logical that I would give all of myself completely and totally to him. I know that we have things to do here, but there is an opportunity extended by the Spirit for those of us who are in a complacent or comfortable place to repent, to turn back to God and say, Jesus, you are most beautiful. And anything in this world that has my affection, 
anything in this world that I would cling to more than you. Anything in this world that is satisfying my heart. Oh, I turn away and I turn to you. And I say, you satisfy. Lord, completely. You satisfy me. Nothing else satisfies me. No substitute will ever do. I've tried substitutes and I've been left unsatisfied. I've tried substitutes and I've been left empty. So I turn to you. There is no other way. Father, forgive us. For making it seem like there were other options. Other choices. Forgive us. May the very core of our being be rocked by the reality that there is no other way. You are the way. Every other way is a counterfeit that leads to death. You are the way. I'm sorry, I just, I don't want to leave this moment with this just being a good message. But I want my very core of my soul to be hit with the truth. May everything else fade away. In light of the Jesus I behold, this is the one I will give my life for. This is the one I will lay down everything for. This is the one, no matter what you require, no matter what, I'm not paying as I go. Oh, but I've given ever, up everything. I won't engage in any more pay-as-you-go Christianity, but I've given up everything. I've given up all ahead of time. Before you ask me, the answer is yes. Before you ask me, the answer is all. Before you require anything of me, I've already given it up. I've already given it up. I've already given it up. There's nothing else to give away because I've already given it up. There's nothing else to surrender because I've already given it up. There's no delay in my obedience because I've already given it up. There's there's no short change to my obedience. It's not partial for me. I've already given it up because you satisfy me. So if you're in this room and you recognize that through the scripture you have been living a life that doesn't resemble the real Jesus, a form of Jesus that maybe you were taught or instructed by, but not the Jesus that requires all. Or if you're in this room and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, many have faltered because they've started off the wrong way. They did not start off by giving all. If you're in this room and you say, I want to come to him giving all. I want to start off. I've counted the cost. And I recognize that what he has done for me, no one else has done. And the life I can have in him, I can have nowhere else. I recognize that I cannot be reconciled back to God any other way, but he is the way. If that's you in this room, without big explanation, if you want to give your life to Jesus, whether that's for the first time 
or for you it's for real this time where you say I'm giving everything to him if that's you in this room on the count of three I just want you to lift those hands in response to Jesus one two three if that's you you want to follow Jesus no turning back you want to give your life to him surrendering completely to him I see those hands if that's you for real this time everything to him yes 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 I even hesitate praying a prayer. I know we give this as language to you and it's right and proper, but I almost feel like the presence of the Lord right now is so significant that you don't need to be guided by my words. You simply just need to tell him, Jesus, I give you everything. My life belongs to you now and forever, now and forever. In fact, if you are, whether you've given your life to Jesus in this moment or you're a believer, just lift those hands to him and give him all, give him all, give him all, give him all. Right where you are, give him all, give him all. This is not something that is stirred on by emotion this is something that comes from the depth of your heart that says Lord Jesus from this day forward my life completely belongs to you you may need to repent of not giving him all you may need to repent of the times you've rejected him you may need to repent of the times you've ignored him but whatever it is in this moment do not allow it to pass by without making a wholehearted commitment to Jesus. Wholehearted, everything, everything. you see your people you see us here we are we're imperfect but we come giving all of ourselves to you may we find a joy in you a satisfaction in you that we have been unable to find anywhere else may we see you as the prize and not as a consolation May we see you as the treasure and not just another treasure. May we see you as the pearl of great price and not just another pearl. You are the one that we lay hold of in this moment. And we give all, all of ourselves to you. Now listen, if you gave your life to the Lord today, you surrendered to him completely. We have some people down front that want to pray with you, give you a Bible, show you next steps. Because of the reverence of this moment, I, I don't want to even engage in too much movement. I know we have to ex exchange services and do all a number of things, but I want to pray for you and dismiss I know we rarely do this, and I know that there's parking and all sorts of things to do, but I know for a fact there are some of you in this room that you cannot leave here without settling some things before the Lord Jesus, that you need to leave here with your life upon the altar. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to dismiss. I'm going to allow our altar workers to find those who just raised their hands. And if you need to go and must go allow you to do that but there are some of you this atmosphere is going to continue to resonate here you need to literally physically move from where you are as an outward sign to say Jesus from this day forward I'm not crawling back off the altar I'm staying on the altar for the rest of my life you can have all of me Father I pray that this word that you have spoken to us we feel the conviction of your spirit and our response is yes. Lord, may this word that you have spoken 
as seed. May it fall within our hearts and produce harvest in our lives. Allow us to respond to this appropriately. Holy Spirit, lead us in the appropriate response day by day that says we are embracing the call to give you all. We have decided to follow you, no turning back. And may your grace go with us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Family, we dismiss you in the name of the Lord. Go in his grace. For those of you who need to come before him, we encourage you. Respond to the call of the Lord.